Hello and welcome to the special edition of APCO Forum, Timely Conversations Catalyzing Progress on Global Topics. I'm John Defterius of APCO Worldwide, joining you from London, where we're looking ahead at a busy calendar of climate action. With just four months until COP27, we're joined by APCO's leading experts on climate action itself and COPs to help you navigate the upcoming event in Egypt and get further ahead in terms of the COP process, looking ahead to COP28, which will take place in the UAE. Uh, let's bring in our panelists to unpack the road ahead. Heather McGarry is the global lead for climate and sustainability. Dean Cambridge is our head of impact based in Europe and with me here in London. And Liam Clark is the head of APCO's Middle East and North Africa climate practice. Welcome to all of you. I, I think Heather, it would be good for us to start kind of giving a COP 101 because we're four months away from uh, the meeting at Sharm El Sheikh. What are you supposed to look out for? We kind of assume that everybody wants to know what's happening in the tent, the dialogue uh, leading to the final communique. But if I'm a, a newbie, if you will, to the COP process, what's most important? Thanks, John. So I think as we look towards COP27, it's really important that we look at what happened last year at COP26 in Glasgow, where there were a significant set of commitments put forward by both countries, um, multilateral institutions, investors, and companies, and civil society. And some of the critical ones there are were the methane pledge, commitment to um, avoided deforestation, um, and then most critically, an, a commitment from the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero on $130 trillion to be allocated by 450 asset managers and owners to um, to fund net zero um, and the tr transition to net zero. And I think what we've seen this year is a real question around how, how do we get that money flowing and flowing more quickly to emerging economies and developing countries and, and, and really move it forward. And so for COP27 this year, which is in the next four months, um, taking place in Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt, there's a real focus on COP26 was about commitments and COP27 needs to be about solutions. And how do we unlock that funding from the donor countries, multilateral institutions, and most importantly, private sector finance to deliver to um, at COP27. Everybody takes a look and says, you know, Egypt's become a major natural gas player in the last five years, Heather. Uh, we know that uh, the UAE is a major uh, oil player, moving into gas, has nuclear, uh, solar. But is there going to be a different conversation uh, beyond what you suggested about unlocking the financing, and that is access? You and I have had these debates at the various climate seminars that we've uh, attended. Uh, 750 plus million people don't have access to energy. Most of those sit in Africa. How do they balance the two out, in your view? I think it's quite hard to sit where we sit in the Western world. I'm you know, in the United States and in Europe, and then to say to countries in Africa and the Middle East that they can't um, provide energy in the same way from a hydrocarbon perspective. Though I will say that I think it's also really important to look to the future and to build towards the future. And I actually just read today that Saudi Arabia has committed to a, one of the largest wind projects in Egypt that will power um, enough electricity for 1 million people. And um, something that's also really interesting about the natural riches and resources of Egypt is yes, it's found natural gas that can be explored, but also it has the highest um, solar and wind potential of any country in Africa. And so um, how do we think about exploring those things that are safer and actually in many cases have become cheaper, the price of renewables can, can be much cheaper than, um, than mining hydrocarbons and then the price of and cost of refining it, as well as it being very volatile, particularly when it's used for internal um, in-country use and not as an export. And I think there's a real distinction to be made there as well. Excellent. Uh, that's government to government, to government investment that you're talking about, uh, Heather, and, and always really important from the Gulf states going into, say, uh, North Africa like Egypt. Liam, uh, do you want to give us a snapshot of what we're hearing in terms of central themes that are on the agenda? Uh, what Egypt was suggesting before, which was a COP for Africa, but it will take a wider view, of course, and give us a sneak peek into um, 
COP28 as well into the UAE. What are you hearing since you sit in the region? Sure, absolutely. Look, uh, there's been a vision set up by the Egyptian president, the prime minister, the leadership, including the minister of environment, uh, who's the ministerial coordinator and envoy. I think there's three things I, I would offer about what to expect in Egypt, and it's around uh, an inclusive COP. It's certainly one for Africa, but it, they want it to be an inclusive COP and one as Heather alluded to a minute ago, that is outcome driven. And then as we move into COP28 in the UAE next year, it, we'll expect discussions to continue around energy access, the energy transition, especially security now and long-term uh, stability. Uh, first, the Egyptians want an inclusive COP that advances the rules, the discussions, and especially the commitments and action that we saw starting the conversations in Glasgow last year. Uh, they're guided by the achievements of the past, uh, including an impressive number of net zero commitments and stronger nationally determined uh, commitments. Uh, now is the time for action. And they're looking for those that did not make commitments in the last round in Glasgow uh, to do that this year. I think the Egyptians are very conscious of perceived failures, uh, the headlines they don't want, the backlash or watering down of the coal draft agreement, for example, accusations uh, of poor diplomacy efforts uh, by the UK, access issues for delegates. They, they want to run a successful meeting. Second, and most of all, the Egyptians want this COP to be outcome driven, as we've been discussing, moving from commitments to action, uh, there'll be a big focus on ambitious commitments from business as well. I think that's what we're starting to hear more about uh, here in the region. Um, it's going to be about the financial deals being made that Heather talked about, pilots moving to scale, and very importantly, uh, climate action plans being presented. What are governments doing and, and what are the private sector going to do? And then finally, you know, uh, it sets the stage to move from uh, North Africa uh, here in the region uh, to the UAE, right? Hosting COP28 next year, there's an opportunity to raise awareness of the critical issues in climate, uh, adaptation, the energy transition, where there's a lot of work going on, of course, in this region. So it's about energy access, security, long-term uh, stability, as well as mitigation. So I think those would be the big themes uh, we hear coming out of COP this year. It's amazing you talk about adaptation. I was doing a seminar with the World Economic Forum, and you hear the language more and more because of the shocks that we've seen as of late in Italy and flooding in Australia, uh, what's been taking place in California for the last uh, two years. Uh, so we have to delve into this idea of mitigation versus adaptation and the expectations for both of these COPs. Uh, Dean, you're an expert in the field. You've been to many COPs. It sounds like a very simple question, but it's an important one because my first one was in Glasgow and it was a logistical challenge to say the least because of the volume of the people and the business community and the policymakers, uh, the environmentalists. Uh, what should you manage at a COP, would you say? Yeah, and uh, I mean, COP26 managed to be pulled off uh, with a, a two-year delay. Um, some would say two-year planning, but the uncertainty around that and COVID and, and whether it was going to happen or not. I know personally some of the, the civil servants there did a fantastic job uh, to be able to, to get that going. Um, and let, let's say look at, look at that two-year timetable that it, that it uh, took people to plan their attendance and, and show up with a with a bang. Um, so I'd say first off, look at a COP strategy, not just COP27, then COP28. Look at this as a 16-month plus strategy so you can get ahead of the planning for COP28. Mm. Um, I mean, if we look at the, the specific details for COP28, they're going gonna, gonna to emerge early next year. Um, there's a, a strong team coming together already within the, the UAE government. Um, and we know where it's going to be held. It's going to be at Expo City in Dubai, right? At the side of Expo 2020. So we're going to expect big things, big innovation, and a lot of excitement around that. Uh, and it's uh, going to be all about the global stock take of progress. It's going to be inclusivity. It's going to be innovation on how to deliver net zero. Uh, and for those starting to plan, it's it's about showing up with, with the plan that, that Liam talked about, not just the commitments. Uh, so we know a lot about Egypt al already, okay? It's, it's four months away. The information has, has been trickling out. There is a draft program. Uh, it's been shared. There's not a lot of detail in it. We don't know the timings of everything yet, but it shows the theme days that, speak, that people can start aligning their plans to, right? So uh, whether it's a science day, decarbonization day, biodiversity, mm. agenda day. Uh, so all the mm. on-site events tend to follow this daily theme structure. And... The uh, I mean, overall, right, the, the COPs are an opportunity to showcase commitment, action, uh, how you're fighting climate change. And this has got to be done in collaboration with others. So uh, 
sort of biggest lesson it's the multi-stakeholder initiatives cross value chain cross sector uh, these are the ones that rise to the top uh, individuals don't cut through companies coming to make announcements that that's not going to rise to the top, top of the agenda because if you're changing systems you don't do that on your own so COPs are mm. about using uh, using the moment to engage a broad range of stakeholders, global decision makers, uh, civil society and customer bases. So you can do very clever comms campaigns, activations, sort of launching reports and roadmaps. And in fact, you don't have to be there on the ground to do that stuff. You just use the moment in time. Uh, but starting now to set up meetings with, with key players uh, in the ecosystem, because uh, they're going to be there uh, for a week or two. And that's critical then as we're planning into COP28 because those relationships developed are going to blossom over the year and they're going to turn into those partnerships, those deals, the announcements uh, in the UAE that, that others are talking about. Uh, I mean, I can go into the, um, the, <laughs> the slightly more boring bits and pieces, right? I mean, participation varies depending on the host and the event, but there's the blue zone. This is where the countries and civil society have their, their pavilions and the side events and businesses can be invited to speak, but uh, it requires a special pass. These were like gold dust in, in COP26. You would have seen people running around oversubscribed, not being able to get into the, into the main event because mm. they're not accredited. Now, you can get that. There are ways to do it with the relationships that, that people have. Um, and Egypt are seeking main sponsors for the corporate world. The, the sponsorship package is available. Uh, you need to hit certain requirements for it. There is a fantastic green zone that's going to be just across the road. That's for the youth groups, the civil society, the artists and the businesses to host events and performances and workshops, et cetera. But then there's this emerging uh, range of side events. Some of it was called the Platinum Zone in, in Glasgow. These mm. are perfect for, for business. This is where often sponsorship involved or partnership, but we look at the World Climate Summit, the Ice Hub, uh, extreme sports have a, a multi-day event there. there. There's something for everyone. We're, we're happy to share all the details of the, of the many event opportunities so people can start aligning with their, their own priorities. Good. That's a really good um primer for us, Dean. Thanks for that. I had some follow-ups, but let me circle back to Heather first about uh, nobody wants to run afoul, if you will. Heather, if you're uh, putting your toes into the COP community, uh, how do you have credibility when you put forward a plan as a company, for example, or as an organization? Or do you go in and say, I need to collaborate with something that's built already? What's the guidance would you give? That's a great question. And for companies, one thing that we always encourage companies to do is to participate in things that are already happening, which I know sometimes for companies, it's hard um, because you want to be unique and you want to stand out. And actually, the best way to participate in driving towards net zero is to collaborate and align with other companies in your sector, in your geography that are um, making those same commitments. And so to participate in the race to zero, which is uh, largely focused on mitigation, the race to resilience, which is focused on resilience and adaptation, and to align your net zero company plans to those to those um, to those activities and then also many companies are participating in things like the science-based targets initiative um, committing to 100% renewable energy or carbon free energy for that's 24 7 and so aligning with best practices within your sector and geography is really critical um, and I would say that if you're just starting your journey that's also okay and, and incredibly welcome um, because there's lots to do and we need everyone to participate and everyone to join in. So if you are starting your journey in this process and you want to attend COP, it's, it's a, I would just encourage everyone to come with auth authenticity and a willingness and a readiness to learn. Good, uh, can you explain briefly, Heather, uh, an expertise that you have with your past work with Dean as well, business matchmaking. What does that mean for somebody who's a novice? Sure. Um, so just thinking about what are the commitments that, going back to what I was saying earlier about COP26, COP26 had a set of commitments that companies and investors could participate in along with countries. And so to align with where the core focus is for your company, which may be around methane reduction, um, uh, stopping avoided deforestation, participating in regenerative agriculture, just overall reducing your emissions to zero, um, finding an alignment through the race to zero, which is um, done by each 
each cop has a high level champion um, that helps what are called non-state actors, which is companies, investors, um, and civil society to come together and make those commitments collectively. So um, that's one way that you can participate and match up with within your sector and then also work with policymakers to advocate for the highest um, and best climate action policy. Interesting. Okay, good. Uh, Liam, uh, you're sitting in the region as we talked about before, and we've gone back and forth to the, the region, geez, I think 10 times in the last six months, and you hear the energy uh, of the plans that are on the tables from some of the bigger Middle Eastern companies that want to make a difference at COP. Uh, Heather talked about aligning geographically. How do you align with a, a Gulf state country uh, or a company or those in Egypt right now, the big industrial players, uh, to make a success of a partnership, do you think? Yeah, look, I, I think Heather and Dean both talked about this. It's about commitments and action or commitments and progress. And those are increasingly the price of participation uh, at many of these COP related forums, uh, regardless of which zone they're in. So I think most businesses in this region are a bit newer to the uh, environment, social governance, ESG frameworks and commitments and reporting, and certainly in some cases to climate commitments. But that's changing. As I talk to business leaders here in the region, that's in, uh, ESG climate, climate commitments uh, are increasingly on their mind. So I think uh, they understand the expectations, they understand that the spotlight is on uh, in Egypt and then next year uh, in the UAE. So when you look at what uh, the governments are doing, for example, the UAE uh, has a net zero by 2050 strategic initiative. Uh, it's a big national drive to reach uh, net zero emissions. The first country in the region to do it. The Saudis, the other big economy in the region, also doing a lot in alternative energy as they seek to move their economies away from, from hydrocarbons and in the energy uh, transformation. Lots of research, lots of, lots of commercialization going on, and lots of uh, investments. Um, it's a big economic opportunity for the economies in this region, uh, and billions and billions are being invested. Now, beyond that, and uh, earlier someone touched on uh, the investments in the smaller nations, the nations most at risk from climate change, who have the least ability uh, on their own to make these investments, both in mitigation and adaptation. And we see tens of billions of dollars being invested both uh, by the UAE and by the Saudis uh, in other countries uh, throughout the world and to back these investments, to get some of the client financing uh, on the table. And really it's a de demonstration of their leadership. Um, but I think what the governments wanna see at the end of the day from companies here is strong ESG performance, credible commitments and climate action plans, not pretty PR programs or greenwashing, but progress. And then certainly as we've seen in the last year or two, stability in supply chains and what that means and increasingly accountability through disclosure and transparency. More and more, uh, we're talking to companies about reporting, they're talking to us about reporting uh, and ensuring they have the right standards, the right level of transparency in place. Good, Liam, just give me a, a if you will, a snapshot of the con conversations that are taking place though. I mean, the last time I was in Egypt and also in Abu Dhabi and Dubai, there is a, a lot of push here uh, to get it right. Uh, they wanted to represent the Middle East, Africa, and uh, Near East Asia, of course. But give us a, a mood uh, reading, if you can. Yeah, look, I think people here understand, especially that there is an apparent contradiction, right, between uh, hosting and taking leadership on climate and still being a big hydrocarbon economy. I think in Egypt, about a quarter of the economy still is uh, in the oil and the gas that, that Heather was talking about, a third of the economy approximately in the UAE is still uh, you know, hydrocarbon based. And I think what you find when you scratch the surface uh, and go a bit deeper, you realize there's a lot of innovation going on. A lot of investments are being made uh, in that energy transformation. And what uh, Egypt and Sharm el Sheikh in the meeting there are coming up in a few months. And as Dean was alluding to, the next 18 months we have uh, until the focus shifts to the UAE is a big opportunity for these governments and for the private sector who is supporting those agendas uh, to show what they've been doing. Dean talked about the Expo 2020 site, what's now called uh, Expo City in Dubai. 
it's a great place where not only local and regional companies, but some of the best practices, best pilot projects in the world, hopefully can come and exhibit what they're doing, which becomes a great opportunity to showcase effective practice. And I think that goes a long way in moving from, from talk to action uh, as the COPs uh, take place here in the region over the next two years. Thanks for taking that. Uh, Dean, there's an alphabet soup of uh, different initiatives that are out there. Do you want to tackle one for us that's at the top of your list? What does race to zero mean for people that want to get involved in COP? Yeah, I know, I know Heather, you, you, you covered some of these, um, these key initiatives. So it, it's such an important one. So let me unpack it a little bit more. And the science-based targets, the, the SBTI, there's, there's one, uh, one acronym there already. Uh, that's key to all of this. It sets the standard. Uh, there is a, a short-term emissions reduction target that, that companies can commit to, and it now has the long-term net zero target. That's defined what net zero really means. I mean, when we all came out of Paris, we said, uh, well, do you have to get on board with this? We said to a lot of companies, where's your commitments? Where's your net zero? And uh, it became very apparent. I was in a meeting with the, the leaders of the SPTI and a, and a lot of other organizations uh, in 2019, and we sat down and said, we haven't told them what good looks like. We haven't told them what net zero means for them. Uh, so after a couple of years of progress, that finally set the standard for what net zero looks like. Now, that wasn't ready in time for, for Glasgow. Um, I mean, we've now we've seen over 3,000 companies committed to SBTs and over 1,000 are already doing the net zero route, but ahead of Glasgow, that, that, that wasn't ready to go. Um, so the race to zero emerged ahead of COP26 to be about consolidation, this alphabet suit. What do you pick? What looks good? Um, so, Heather, you mentioned the, the high level champions um, that about mobilizing non state actors. So, who better to appoint for COP26 than Nigel Topping, who Heather and I used to work with at the We Mean Business Coalition? Uh, that's the pl platform that since 2015 have been funding and developing the leading initiatives for climate action. So Nigel quickly created this race to zero. Uh, it brought sense to the landscape. It put some criteria in place and it said to stakeholders, this is how you identify the best initiatives because it has the stamp of approval from the race to zero. Uh, so there's 7,000 companies now, over 1,000 cities, 1,000 academic institutions, 3,000 hospitals, and many, many more. Uh, but how do you join it? And this is where a lot of the confusion came in. You just turn up and say, well, I'm raised to zero now. Here's my net zero commitment. Part of the consolidation means uh, bringing together partner initiatives. So there's lots of them. Uh, ones at the top are business ambition for 1.5. Uh, this is essentially the SBTI net zero commitment. There's a climate pledge that Amazon uh, brought together with Christiana Figueres, the architect of the Paris Agreement, one of the architects, and that has a net zero 2040. There's also stuff for SMEs in there. So there's the SME Climate Hub, uh, the B Corp movement. Uh, and there's a range of sector-based ones as well. So Tech Zero, there's the Fashion Charter. John, there's even a Whiskey Association one, um, which uh, you can imagine. In Glasgow, that, that was a big thing, right? Yes. Uh, so it's, it's not just about these commitments. Once the company joins, it's tightening this noose uh, around those 7,000 plus uh, others that have, have committed. You need to publish a credible plan within one year of joining. Um, and they toughened it even more as of June 15th. So all members now need to phase down and phase out unabated fossil fuels. So all of those GFANs, Net Zero Bankers Alliance, all of those finance, uh, financial industries that have signed up now need to look, look at what they're doing with unabated fossil fuels. Uh, they've also got to align all of their policy and advocacy activities with, with Net Zero. Um, so there's there's other pieces that are part of this as as well. Um, the sister campaign that Heather talked about, the end of race to resilience. Um, there's also a big space around roadmap development through the race to zero breakthrough. So um, there's focus on different sectors, their uh, pathways for heavy industries, for example. So it all still sounds complex, but trust me, this is a lot better than it than it was. Good. We have some questions coming in on the chat box. I invite others uh, to go ahead and put those in. We'd be happy to share them with Heather, uh, Dean, and Liam. Uh, one that's come up here is uh, after the invasion of uh, Russia and Ukraine and, and the conflict that we see there, there's been more of a tilt towards energy security and less about the energy transition. We saw the decision from the Supreme Court in the United States on, on coal and the state rights to produce coal and not being governed by the federal government. Uh, Heather, do you want to jump in and give us the view from America on the ladder here? Does it really undermine the
the efforts by the Biden administration, for example, to maintain the momentum as a, a leader in climate policy or not? What do you make of it and how does it affect the COP process in your view? Yeah, I think, you know, you mentioned two really important phrases, energy transition and energy and, and energy security. And I mm. think we get energy security when we make the energy transition. And um, oh, that's an interesting way of putting of, it. Yeah, there's a lot of opportunity to be using renewables and to integrate them more um, more into our into our grid, particularly as our grids become more and more stressed because the we are things are getting warmer and warmer, and we are using more and more air conditioning, right? And so we have more of these days where. Um, where our grids are are overburdened and they're also quite old, right? And we need infrastructure upgrades overall. And so I think that energy security is not just about using more hydrocarbons and and firing up coal coal fired power plants. Um, we've got to upgrade our infrastructure, use more renewables. Honestly, I know this is a very controversial thing that I'm going to say is we also have to have the nuclear energy conversation also. Um, I think that's another way that we get to energy security. Um, and then also battery storage is another critical piece here. And so I think that in the short term, the most logical pathway, the well-tread pathway is that we should be um, going back to hydrocarbons and taking more of them out of the ground. And for the short term, that may help us with some of these exogenous shocks for those of us who are not in, in, um, in Europe, Ukraine, and Russia. Um, but we're, we're really got to make the transition. And so we can also look at this issue as one where we can double down in other areas and not just hydrocarbons. And then just to address the EPA issue, you know, I think we're seeing what a, an overly conservative court is focused on right now. And I think that they started with the EPA ruling saying that um, that the agency EPA can't re legislate uh, or can't regulate power plants. But I think that's also just creating a foundation for limiting the control of agencies overall. And, and starting with the EPA is is one of those. Wow, that's quite a statement in itself there, Heather. Um, the question that came through for you, Dean, and that is, uh, do I have to be, as a corporation, having pledged to net zero by 2050 to even get within the apparatus of COP27 or COP28? What's the answer to that? Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. And it's, it's been the ongoing conversation with a lot of organizations over, over many months. Um, so the UK set a bit of precedent here uh, ahead of COP26. And um, I'm going to say this this was not necessarily by um, by design. It was about creating a, a good benchmark to allow people to be part of the conversation. And so they wanted speakers uh, and sponsors to demonstrate that they're aligned with limiting warming to 1.5 or that they had a net zero commitment really to be part of the main events. And it, it didn't preclude them from being part of other side events or, or turning up to be part of the conversation. It's not like but you know, you've got to show your get zero tattoo to be able to get into the to get into the events. Um, but I mean, increasingly, net zero is becoming the barrier for engagement. Um, I, I mentioned mm -hmm. some of the, the heavy industry collaborations under initiatives such as the Mission Possible Partnership. Uh, so this is WEF, World Business Council, WIMI Business, and others. Uh, working with lots of collaborators to decarbonize the steel industry, cement, aviation, shipping, and, and more. And these are all about practical information, uh, implementation. It's about supply and demand side collaboration. Uh, and they're all pushing members to be net zero, as we've seen WEF done. And we, we're even seeing it in industry associations too. Um, I know we've spoken many times about the mining sector and responsible transition of minerals, right, John? Um, the ICMM, uh, the uh, International Council of Metal and Mining, uh, last year ahead of the COP, actually, um, knowing that you might not get much cut through in, in a busy space, just a, another top tip there. Uh, ahead of that, they launched their members' commitment to, to net zero, um, a, a massive move, the largest players in the industry committing to net zero. Uh, mm. The cement sector have done that for the, the Global Cement and Concrete Association. And we're seeing that in more and more industry associations to say, we are not lobbying bodies, we are not trade associations. If you want to be part of the solution um, and you want access to these rich roadmaps with us, then you need to you need to make a commitment to net zero. 
Um, but look, if, if you don't have a net zero commitment, um, that's that's not the end of the conversation because sometimes there aren't the pathways. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's, it's just not a, a clear route or there are many reasons why people don't want to take a leap of faith, right, and say, in 2050, I'm, I'm going to get here. I'm going to focus on the short term. I'm going to look at the next five years or 10 years, or I'm going to collaborate with others. So it's about demonstrating the actions that are being taken, the targets that are in place, uh, being transparent. We've, we've spoken a bit about that already, mm. but being transparent about the challenges as well. When I was saying earlier about use COP as an opportunity to start those conversations, engage the stakeholders. I mean, go with an open heart and say, we're seeking partnership and collaboration to overcome these challenges that we've got. Please help us because somewhere there are the answers. Uh, and probably finally, I'll say, uh, it's not all just about COP, right? Uh, climate action is a long journey and COP's a very important piece of it. But there are key milestones along the way to engage and demonstrate leadership and, and learn. Uh, so that can be major moments like Davos or T20 or many sector-based events or even um, the likes of the you know, Reuters, the Green Biz, the FT, Business Green, the Net Zero Festival, all of these really important moments, uh, not to mention the climate weeks as well. Uh, a key for, for engagement. So um, be transparent, be honest about uh, about the challenges, um, be clear about the plans that are in place. Uh, if you've not got a net zero, it doesn't mean that you can't head up to them. Okay, uh, you know, Liam, uh, people talk about collaboration a, a lot in industry and having various sectors uh, work on a common goal. And I've noticed in, in Abu Dhabi over the last uh, five months in particular, you have the sovereign fund Mubadla uh, working with Mazdar, which is a renewable energy investor. And, and in fact, it's a Mubadala company. Taka, the utility company, uh, Enic, which is the nuclear energy corporation of the Emirates, and then Adnoc, the oil and gas player. That is quite a signal to have major players like that that sit in the UAE, suggesting they're going to do both inbound investment and diversify their energy supplies, uh, but also outbound investment uh, as well. Do you want to give us a, a taste of what that tells us about the UAE strategy for COP28? Yeah, absolutely. Look, um, as we've been discussing, this is about practical solutions. I think success is about, of these COP meetings, is to go beyond commitments to practical solutions. And, mm. you know, uh, politics and negotiating and diplomacy will get you a certain distance. At the end of the day, this has to become mainstream, right? It has to be part of investment strategies. And in this part of the world, sovereign wealth funds, I think are a good bellwether to look at. What are they investing in domestically? What technologies are they innovating in? And it's kind of interesting to see a fund that, uh, you know, invests in petroleum companies and oil and gas infrastructure historically, uh, continuing what's frankly been a multi-year journey into the energy transformation, what's gone on with Mazdar, uh, and some of the other activities around uh, the next generation of renewable, renewable energy. And then those commitments going internationally, both uh, through investments and through uh, more of a foreign aid approach to help other countries come along uh, on a different journey. Now, in other countries, especially in the West, right, sovereign wealth funds tend to play a bit of a different role. We have to look at uh, legislative conditions, policy making and rule making that make uh, investments uh, in climate action, investments in, in the energy transformation attractive. But here, I think it says a lot about the leadership. And frankly, it, it addresses the apparent uh, you know, uh, contradiction head on to say there are leaders who sit over uh, oil companies and also over renewable energy companies, and they see and talk about the transition uh, every day. And I, I think there could be a lesson taken from that for those who can pay attention, look into the detail, look past the apparent uh, a contradiction into what real transformation, R&D, investment, and commercialization of these technologies looks like. Yeah, you make a good point on the uh, sovereign fund activity in the UAE. Uh, Mubadal is a member of the Global Hydrogen Council as well, so it's putting its money where its mouth is on that front as well. And to see, as you suggested, a national oil company willing to um, diversify its investments as well and reduces carbon footprint at the, at the same time. I think it would be good to get all of you to weigh in on how do you measure a successful COP? I know there was some frustration at the end of COP26, for example, Dean, uh, when it was whether we phase out or phase down on coal. But again, there was a lot of concrete results coming out of it. Do you want to start, Dean, and then Heather pick up off the back of it, please? 
Uh, no um, COP president wants to end the, the main event and apologising. And I think part of that was thinking that uh, they were so close um, to then have some some red lines put through. But I mean, Heather, you, you covered this well on the on the energy transition. I mean, and just to to make a point on that, and then I'll, I'll, I'll go back to what we want to see out of, of COP because it's relevant. I mean. Um, we know you can't just switch off fossil fuels tomorrow, right? It's not going to work in any part of the world. That's why we call it a, a transition. And, and you made all the, all the important points there. Um, we're, we're turn, having to turn back on coal plants and escalating fuel costs, sliding back on climate commitments is um, is just not where, where we want to be. And that's a result of not putting the investment that we need in. Um, as the Monte Lens talked a lot about this recently and that the IEA, uh, IEA has already reported that the investments in, in oil and gas um, are fine for the, the transition, but it's not going to meet the rising energy demand. So if we want access, security and stability, that Wayne's been talking a lot about, um, this has got to come through massive acceleration in, in renewables, putting electric vehicles on the road, but also getting smarter about how we do things. And this is what we, we really need to see out of this COP as well. Um, the innovation, putting money where it needs to be, but what are the new modes of mobility? Uh, what's the role of circularity? Again, going back to the minerals piece, yes, we need to accelerate extraction over the next 10 years, but the industry itself recognizes that post 2030, and um, what we need to be moving into then is circularity of these materials. How are we gonna use the resources that we've extracted that we have in, in, a, in a much better way? Um, also, uh, sort of, what are the solutions that we have now uh, we can look to the future and in investment in carbon removal technologies and lots of exciting things. Um, but we know also nature is uh, is a proven intended method for carbon removals, and we need to accelerate investment there. Uh, but we've worked with a lot of uh, organizations in the building sector, and energy efficiency is so overlooked. This like, yes. trope of the low-hanging fruits that we yes. can be um, having access to. I mean, the UK, uh, I mean... <laughs> The UK government have been slapped on the wrist for a lot of things recently, and we won't go into the depths of uh, what happened last night, but a couple of weeks ago, uh, probably amongst all of the things that were coming out, it was said the UK is simply not going to hit its, its net zero targets. We're going to fail on our, our carbon budget. Uh, um, energy efficiency is one of those key pieces that homes in the UK will lose so much heat because we've not taken uh, advantage of the solution. Simple things like insulation. I mean, that's not, not the most innovative thing in the world, but there needs to be policies in place uh, it needs to be more recognition awareness of the of the easy things that we can be doing to tackle climate change um because that's the key piece right let's forget net zero we, we've got to halve emissions in this decade we need to restore nature we've got to pursue every possible opportunity without fear of failure and um, if we're going to prevent the worst impacts of climate change and if that's making sure people put insulation in the right place and pop up into, into their lofts and, and put some heat pumps in, then that's what we've got to be accelerating right now. And I expect some of those things to be coming out of the action cop. Okay, good, excellent. Uh, one of the things that's also talked about, Heather, as you know, there was a methane pledge at COP26 that if you look at a, a low uh, line fruit, you would say, okay, why do we have uh, methane emissions like emissions from buildings that, uh, Dean's talking about here. How would you measure a successful COP when it comes to practical measures that move the needle? Yeah, I'll just say, I think there are three things that I would be looking out for for COP, um, around COP or, or moving the ball down the field at COP, I, we should say. And the first thing is this $100 billion of uh, funding that's supposed to go to emerging economies and developing countries around mitigation adaptation that donor countries have committed to um, for the last 10 or so years, but that fund hasn't been full. And so we have got to fill that fund as a first step. It's, it's just basic. Um, and then filling that fund will also help to lead the way for public private partnerships around further investment. Mm. I think the next thing that we need to do is look for signs around um, mechanisms, approaches, tools for de-risking investment in emerging markets and developing economies that are for climate finance. And, and that the GFAN's $130 trillion commitment last year, and then what has to get done, we've got to be speaking the same language and figuring out how to look at those investments 
through the key lenses of due diligence and taking the appropriate approaches so that the, the investments are protected, because in many cases it's institutional money, inst institutional investment money that's protecting people's pensions, right? So it has to be handled responsibly, but also the projects have to be de-risked using multilateral um, development banks and, and funds like the Green Climate Fund and others so that we can actually get in there and start to make that transitional change that we really need to, to decarbonize our economy. And then the third thing I think we're looking for is, are we creating the mechanisms and the, um, and the bylaws and the rules for carbon markets? It's a trillion dollar market or nearly a trillion dollar market. It's a key tool, both for removals and offsets when I talk about the carbon market for transitioning companies countries, investors to getting to net zero, and it has other benefits along the way. There are biodiversity benefits, public health benefits that come from emissions reductions and removals, while in the interim, we're working on technologies to, that are going to get us totally to net zero. And so the carbon markets, they're starting in fits and starts. You can see in different countries where they've started up, and now what we need is interoperability, fungibility, and, and total clarity on um, what can be traded and what its value is. Good. Let's uh, bring in uh, Liam here and the perspective of Egypt and the UAE. Um, they pledged initially it was going to be the, the COP for Africa for COP27. Uh, COP28, the, kind of, the UAE is a kind of a natural investor, as you know, in, in Africa itself, in the broader region, uh, South Asia. It's always played that role with high uh, percentage of GDP into developing uh, markets. What do you think they're going to do to measure success, uh, Liam? Let's start with Egypt, and you can carry into the UAE. Yeah, I think it's, it's true in both cases, but for, first and especially with Egypt, is to have an inclusive COP. There have to be discussions that include and spend time and real focus uh, on the African continent, as well as other places that don't have the resources right now to fund this transition, the investments uh, themselves. So as I think, as, as we talk about and think about uh, the non-governmental actors, the other stakeholders, and where they fit in COP27 in Egypt, and then continuing on to the UAE next year, those that have commitments, investments, and history uh, in the African continent, I think, have a real place to play and a voice to be heard. And I think for those who maybe haven't thought as much about that, it, they should start thinking about it now, because that is going to be, I think, a very relevant part uh, of the conversation now and into next year. And, and the Emiratis have already started talking about that, that they want to continue this focus on having an inclusive COP, that they want the conversation to move beyond you know, the big uh, traditional actors and have a full seat at the table uh, for others, because that's frankly what's going to get us um, you know, the rest of the way there and, and see real, real progress. So I think it's about solutions, but it's about inclusive solutions. And I think they're really, uh, willing to be judged on how successful they are in doing that because it's so high on their priority list. Good. Final point, uh, Heather, if I can call on you here. Was net zero to 2050 a mistake? It's become something that you can kick down the road. And as Liam was alluding to, Dean did on numerous occasions as well. Uh, you know, it's not just show me the money in the case of the developing countries, but it's show me action that's concrete. Uh, to the close of 2030 in terms of emissions reductions and we can't get distracted on a long-term goal. Yeah, I think it's the classic, can you see the forest for the trees and the trees for the forest at the same time? And I don't, and I think it's very, um, important that we have a long-term goal, but to meet those long-term goals, we have to have interim targets. So we know that we mm. have to get to a 45% emissions reduction by 2030. And here we are sitting in the middle of 2022 and very few of us have really clear plans um, to get to net zero and to even um, have our emissions in the next seven and a half years. And so I think that we, all need to um, take that approach of, of interim targets. And in fact, the, um, the Climate Action 100 plus net zero company benchmark has just recently added to their, um, to their roadmap that you have to have um, interim, bench, uh, interim targets to qualify as being a, a best practice company. Okay, Dean, I'll give you the final word. We talk about the supply chain. It was broken during the pandemic, right? We had the Ever Given stuck in the Suez Canal. Uh, what does net zero mean for the global supply chain when the people are worried about inflation right now? And then we'll wrap it up. 
Yeah, I mean, this is this is going to be the big one to watch, right? Let's, let's give a current example in Europe where, where we're sitting. Um, the European Commission has, has just issued this proposal uh, for a directive on corporate sustainability due diligence. Uh, so this is all about tackling human rights and environmental impacts across global value chains as part of a range of tightening ESG rules that are going to come in over 2022 off the, off the back of what happened in 2021. It's going to take time to pass through the necessary checks and balances to become law, but it's a strong signal of uh, the eye of, of investors and governments on impacts and risk within supply chain to be able to get ahead of those issues that you were talking about. Um, and the leading companies are already uh, responding to this uh, and, and getting ahead of the game, uh, especially those with net zero commitments uh, that are going to rely on their supply chains to step up and say, we've, we've committed, so what are you going to do? Uh, so people have got to expect increased requests from big buyers, from tenderers, from government tendering, uh, to demonstrate plans and emission reduction targets that we've all talked about here. I mean, this is the cost of doing business is going to align around net zero. Um, we will see this, uh, we're, so we're already seeing this in uh, a lot of government tenders, a 10% coming in in the NHS, in defence contracts for, to show your, your CSR value. Um, and uh, know that a number of uh, big companies, part of the race to zero that we talked about earlier, like Nestle, BT, Unilever, have already been sending out letters to their, their major suppliers uh, to say, show us your plans, show us what you've got in place, commit to net zero, join an SME climate hub, or be part of the race to zero, otherwise you will not be on the, on the top list. So uh, the impact of, of net zero on, on supply chains is, is going to be uh, catch up quickly uh, get your house in order and, and be ready to to join the, the big players on their path to net zero. It's so interesting what you're saying because I remember the shipping industry is saying it can't be done to clean up our fuel chain, right? But uh, there's been a lot of innovation mm -hmm. and a lot of pressure after the regulations yeah. uh, were put in place. It's great to have all three of you share your thoughts from a very global perspective. Heather McGeary, who's our global lead for climate and sustainability. Dean Cambridge is the head of impact. Uh, based in Europe. He's in the UK today. Liam Clark, head of APCO's Middle East and North Africa climate practice, joining us from the UAE. I'm John Devteris, and thanks for joining us for this special edition of the APCO Forum. You can follow us on our social media channels to get an update on when this is going to rerun again, and to join the conversation with us on Twitter and all our social media platforms as well. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.